Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining this uh, joint webinar with Zscaler and Contact. Um, the two presenters today is Joe Burtnick, uh, Chief Technology Officer of Compact, and Aaron Ramsey, one of the Senior Sales Account Managers at Zscaler. Um, I will now pass over to Joe Burtnick, who will uh, start the start the show rolling. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. Appreciate that introduction, and welcome everybody to our webinar today. As we've been working with Zscaler over the last four years, we've been developed a close relationship in helping customers manage the security of their ever dissolving and changing perimeters. And nothing has impacted that more than the shift for many organizations to remote working. And of course, one of the challenges with that is being able to deliver that security uh, securely. Today's session is really going to focus on how we can help customers manage secure uh, workforces remotely within their organization and the power of Zscaler to help really deliver that. And Aaron, if you can give me the next slide. Within Comtact, and the next one, if you would. We were established in 2005. As I said, we have a very long relationship with Zscaler. Uh, matter of fact, in our first year, even winning partner, new partner of the year. And that really focused around our ability to specialize with customers and really get the most out of a Zscaler deployment. As a matter of fact, in one customer uh, case study that we have, the customer was looking at deploying Zscaler and of course, out of the box, getting a, a whole host of functionality, but being able to go in and understand the customer's specific business unit requirements around securing their perimeter, we're able to really deliver a solution that uh, delivered immediate value out of the box for that customer and really achieved helping them better manage Zscaler in a way where they were able to really see 80, 90% of the value of the solution from the beginning. And so we've worked with customers like that, and look forward to working with more, not only in helping deploy and manage Zscaler through our managed service offerings, but as well monitoring and, and using Zscaler as part of a managed detection and response infrastructure. But with that being said, let me turn it back, uh, turn it over to Aaron now to take us through the material and explain how Zscaler can help you with remote workforce management. Hi everyone, uh, thanks very much for the intro Joe and Phil. Um, <clears throat> my name is Aaron Ramsey and yes, I will have heard all the jokes about either footballers or cooking, depending on your preference. Um, and as Phil's introduced, I'm an account manager here at Zscaler. So, <clears throat> just get on to the next slide. Uh, I'm gonna start off by talking a little bit about what we traditionally have seen in this marketplace um, and what has more historically been customers architecture. And this may be similar for a lot of you on the call today. So. Typically, um, the data center has pretty much been the legacy, the heart, the entirety of the security hub um, for most businesses and users. <clears throat> As you can see here, typically, and in, in some cases, a lot of what I'm still seeing today is people working either in satellite offices or remote from home offices are back calling into the uh, data center and then breaking out directly to the internet. Uh, similarly, for the likes of VPN, so your private applications, things that perhaps you aren't quite as happy to have outbound um, in a more public space, it's very similar whereby they're going through the inbound firewall as well in order to break through and access those applications. However, um, it's not been perfect in the past, and I think given what's happening currently, it's been proven to be even more troublesome. Um, Typical complaints tend to be user experience. It's a pretty large part of what we do here at Zscaler. And one of the things I will perhaps walk through a little bit later on is where can we improve that user experience? And another factor is security, which I'll touch on on the next slide actually. So one thing in particular is that we're seeing is that digital transformation is becoming more mandatory than just nice to have. Um, there are people I've been speaking to for a number of years now who have had projects such as migrating to 365 starting to roll out laptops to their workforce that's been on the books for months and months and months and it's just projects that you know have kind of floundered and never really had the priority that perhaps they should have done and then COVID-19 has struck worldwide and we find ourselves in a dramatically different workforce environment so digital transformation is pretty much here um, it's something the CEO of Zscaler Jay Chowdhury saw 10 11 years ago now I don't think even he quite foresaw the change that we were going to have in the marketplace but this is where we currently are um, the main point here that I'd like to focus on really is the mobility. Even if we get back into the office, a lot of studies are showing, and I think there's some information and statistics to back me up on this a little bit later on in this slide deck, <coughs> but they're showing that most workers would like to have a balance going forward. They don't want to spend five days a week in the office anymore. While five days at home is not ideal either, and most people do not want to return to this or even stay in this position as we are now, 
Um, most workers seem to want a bit more of a balance, like I say, for the likes of childcare, for the likes of just general outside life, you know, being able to schedule appointments. And likewise, we are starting to see, and we were starting to see even before COVID hitting, users were starting to travel more. You know, they go to a Starbucks for lunch, they go out to a massive group meal with everyone else in the office, you know, they're whining and dining clients. There is more movement inside the business and how do we kind of enact and enable that going forward? I would agree, Aaron. I think one of the changes that a lot of organizations have seen, you know, COVID-19 hasn't given us a completely disparate way of working. A lot of organizations were moving down that path and more than anything, I think they've had their eyes opened. The, not only the necessity of it currently, but the long-term potential for their business. Agreed. In fact, <clears throat> let's go into that in a little bit more detail. There's typically three stages that we see as people move more and more towards the cloud. And in fact, I'm sure many of the people on this call and most of the people I speak to just in my day to day job are already in at least stage two of this. Um, first is the application transformation. So this is where what has traditionally been more legacy inside the data center is actually starting to migrate outbound now. This is the likes of Salesforce. This is the likes of 0365. You know, the things which used to be hosted are now being migrated outwards and if that's the case, then why are we now relying on an old legacy architecture model whereby we're backhauling our users? So the next step, quite straightforward, is network transformation, breaking out to the cloud. As it says up at the top here, the cloud is becoming the new data center. And in fact, one of the quotes that we have a little bit later on is specifically that there is no real corporate network anymore. We are starting to see that disband. Um, it may depend on how far along various people are in those projects, but it is something we're starting to see happen more and more in the marketplace. So thereby, again, a pretty key point here is the user experience side. If we're no longer expecting the users to actually use resources that are required in the office, why then are we back calling them to that office location? And finally, and this part tends to come along pretty similar. Um, people may take a little bit longer to move over to a network transformation, but once you begin the network transformation, security does become pretty much immediate um, because ultimately one of the key parts of my job is discussing security. It's where Zetscaler started and it's pretty much the foundation for most businesses. Um, how do we therefore make sure that these applications are actually protected and that these users are only accessing what they should be? There is a whole host of architecture, applications, and in many cases, threats out there. So now that these users are no longer being backhauled to this data center that has always been the kind of hub, um, how do we make sure that they're actually protected in their day-to-day -day jobs? And that's what I'm here to talk to you about a little bit today. In a world where cloud is the new data center, as I say, the corporate network is kind of disappearing and we're now finding ourselves in a position where internet is the new network. The business policies are what's actually connecting your users and apps. Um, the kind of castle of moat and the backhauling that I've discussed previously are starting to disappear. And finally, users connect to the apps, but not the network itself. So we wanna make sure that your users are only accessing what they should be rather than whichever they like, which has been historically quite a large problem around VPN solutions. So, how does that together do it? Well, I'm going to start off with our main product line and the one that some people on the call perhaps may know us for. Um, it's the one that we've had since we kicked off business originally, what we call Zscaler Internet Access or ZIA. So really what this is, as it's summing up quite nicely here, is it's your inline inspection. We're blocking the bad and protecting the good. This is what we define ourselves by on the Secure Web Gateway quadrant. Um, we've actually been a leader in Gartner's magic quadrant of that space now for the past nine years. and. To be honest, I'd be very, very surprised if we didn't get number 10 this year as well, which is something you'll probably hear us shouting about quite a lot internally. Um, really, the basis and the architecture of this is really nice and straightforward. We ask that you break your traffic out directly to us and we forward it out to the internet. We have a two terabyte peering capacity with most of the major service providers. So 0365 being a pretty critical one for most people out there. Also having that capacity with the likes of Google and Amazon. Um, so we can break out your traffic to those guys, get it back to your users sooner rather than later and just ensure that they're going about their work day. Um, I do have a metric actually, which I calculated with the customer, whereby they were losing about five, 10 minutes a day of wasted productivity time on 0365, just due to latency, people getting annoyed a bit, going up for a coffee, a cigarette, playing with the kids, that sort of thing. So I'll talk a little bit about that later as we go on, and specifically how we migrate with Microsoft and some of our partnerships there. Next, um, one of the key points for this webinar was talking specifically about the application space, which is where we came with Zscaler Private Access. So it's a little bit different to a traditional access solution. Um, we work strictly off the basis of zero trust network access. So we're segmenting your network apart. No longer are we allowing your users to kind of just flood in via a VPN, access whatever they want, and then go about with the day. Now your users are only accessing that what they should be. 
So for example, you could group your applications into financial and engineering, at which point your financial end users will only be able to access financial applications. And likewise, your engineering end users will only be able to access engineering applications. Really segmenting that, that network down and just making sure that people aren't just going willy nilly with your data and you know accessing things which perhaps they shouldn't be. It's also really good for kind of exposing the shadow IT. Um, I'll touch a little bit more on the architecture and how this actually looks on a later slide. We've got us something breaking it down, but essentially we can set a version of this into discovery mode. So perhaps there's any shadow IT lurking around in your network, which you're not aware of, we can help weed that out and eliminate it. I'm just gonna get this fully loaded up as well. And uh, as it's saying here as well, the new net security is business policies more than anything. Likewise, for the Zscaler internet access, um, again, I'll touch on Microsoft in, enough, in a bit more detail later on, but one of the main partners that we have in that space from a technology perspective would be Azure AD. We can sync up quite nicely with those guys. So <clears throat> to go into more detail from Zscaler internet access, I'm gonna start off with these. Um, these are the two main use cases which were originally brought to us most commonly um, and still are pretty much the cornerstone of my discussions with customers, um, 0365 and threat protection. As I've said before, apps are starting to migrate out the network, forcing that network transformation and therefore security. So here, seeing it exactly the two main use cases of security and applications. Um, as your users start to move over more and more to the likes of 0365, we need to make sure that we've got a seamless way for them to go through and connect to that and access those applications quickly and seamlessly, as well as have the best user experience possible. 0365 tends to be fairly meaty and take up a lot of bandwidth, so we have a number of features around that, which you'll see in the slide a little bit later on. Likewise, threat protection, ultimately, your users are gonna, still going to need to access the general internet. Even if all your apps go into SaaS, there will still be a need for them to Google, um, quickly search up information, and I'm sure most users, I've never met one who didn't, will be accessing the likes of YouTube and Netflix and various recreational websites during the likes of lunch and quick five or 10 minute breaks. So how do we make sure that they're actually protected when they're out there on the open internet and not exposing themselves and thereby your company to threats which are out there? Um, COVID-19 especially has seen a huge dramatic increase in phishing emails, um, which I'm sure is something that many of you on this call will have seen across your businesses as well. The next one <clears throat> is something that's come across a little bit later on. Um, as I say, the first two are very much still relevant today and have been since we started business. But as people started migrating more and more out of the office, they need something that's going to actually break them out and connect them pretty seamlessly um, and make sure that to do so is nice and easy. I'll show you a little bit about what this user experience would look like on the demo and making sure that those guys are secure, um, specifically from a device perspective. But one of the nice benefits of Zscaler is we work on a per user basis and each user can have up to 17 concurrent devices. If you have a user with more than 17 concurrent devices, I would say that's a bit of a different problem anyway. And finally, um, a massive use case still to this day and one of the main reasons that we get brought into a lot of people's projects um, by our other partners is the SD-WAN. Um, as we people start to move away from the WAN network, again, you do still need a way to make sure that these offices are then secured. And now that you have offices that are capable of doing local breakout, why are we not better enabling that and then allowing them to do so? So that's kind of where we steer into that curve as well. And to sum it up quite nicely here, uh, standardization, simplification and identical protection. We're making sure that we don't really care where your users are based. It doesn't make a difference to me whether I'm in home, uh, whether I'm in the office, if I go to a Starbucks, if I'm on site for a customer meeting, it's pretty much irrelevant to me as a user of this service. Um, I get the exact same experience. Just because I'm at home doesn't mean I can suddenly access gambling websites. Just because I'm back in the office doesn't mean I can suddenly access a lot of internal information that I couldn't previously. None of that really matters because I'm still going for the same provider. And to go through some of our services in a bit more detail, um, specifically one that I'd focus on here would be the uh, bandwidth control. So talking about the 0365, as I've say, it tends to be quite heavy on the bandwidth. So really we're just making sure that traffic is prioritized right there. There's a few bits on here actually, which is why I sort of disagree. We've gotten this classification of us as a secure web gateway, because I do think in some facilities, we do go a little bit above and beyond what would typically be classed as SWG functionality. For example, exact data matching, which is actually a customer enhancement request, um, browser isolation, out of band CASB, just to name a few. Um, but at the same time, it is still pretty much at the heart and core of what we do here at Zscaler. I would definitely agree, Aaron. I think that you know, for a lot of customers that we've worked with, Zscaler really extends their perimeter so they can be able to behave and function outside of the office, whether they're in a, a Costa at their home, 
you know, on the road, wherever they may be, their security moves with them. And that kind of, you know, dissolving perimeter means that you, you effectively have a bubble that moves around with the user. Additionally, the capability to not just have a secure web gateway, as you mentioned, like Gartner defines it, but to also layer on and tackle, you know, your first problem when it comes to data loss prevention, which is exfiltration of data. Being able to manage that all in one interface becomes a real win for customers. Agreed. And in fact, it's mentioning Gartner again, but when we combine the two together, this is where we start to steer into what Gartner is now defining as SASE. Um, security as a software, uh, apologies. Security as a service edge and making sure that that really is just following your users around no matter where they're based. So in terms of ZPA, the use cases, um, I'm starting out with personally, in my opinion, what I would say is perhaps the weakest one, um, which is defined here as no VPN, but realistically is a VPN replacement. Um, it's not our best use, in my opinion. I think VPNs do have a time and a place. And while I do think that that time and place is getting reduced as time goes on, ultimately they do still exist in the marketplace and I think they will for a long time. However, a lot of people do just want to get rid of them, which is perfectly fine. We're capable of doing that. We can help facilitate that removal. But really the main use cases, in my personal opinion, are firstly direct access to multi-cloud. Um, as we've touched on, applications are moving out and networks are transforming rapidly, especially in the past six, seven months. The amount of people that I've started to see move over to the likes of Azure and AWS for infrastructure is staggering. I'm not seeing too much of Google personally. Um, tends to be AWS as the main one with Azure, but that's also perhaps just what I'm seeing myself. Um, as such, users are spread out across multiple clouds, both in and also internal. Um, it's not just, you know, there's a lot of people who view that, oh, well, if I start going out towards these, you know, different cloud production environments, do I then have to move all my infrastructure over on the first day? Well, no, you don't. And one of the nice advantages of ZPA is that we actually facilitate that. So kind of brings me into a nice time to actually talk a little bit about the architecture, but ZPA architecture is really nice and straightforward. All we're doing is putting a connector in front of your data center, wherever your apps are hosted, then your user is connecting through to that. It's that simple. So for example, if you had an internal private application inside your data center over here, then one day you decide, okay, it's time, you know, I'm ready. I'm not going to move this out to the AWS cloud instead. All we're going to do is move a connector across. It doesn't make a difference to us in Zscaler and it won't make a difference to your user as well. And I'll show you what this user experience will look like. But for me, I don't care where things are hosted. I don't, I shouldn't have to care as a user. It should just be a case if I click, I go, I'm there. MA and RT integration is a pretty key one as well. Um, MA may not be a dramatic part of your business, but this also applies quite nicely, as I click here, into the third party. Because we work off Zero Trust Network application, and really what we're doing is locking down your network and making sure that only the relevant people can access the relevant applications, um, it applies for both. If you bring on a new company or if you bring on a new supplier or a new third party, someone who, you know, perhaps, okay, I trust these guys, but at the same time, I don't really want them running around free inside my network. That's fine because we're going to be syncing up with your AD, your Azure in this instance. You've given them the domain, okay, um, so and so at thirdparty.co.uk, then nice and simple. These guys can only access in this separate grouping the applications which are actually relevant to their job. You know, they're only coming in to do engineering work, so they don't actually need access to our financial applications. And to do so would actually cause a bit of a breach. Um, I don't know if anyone on this call would remember the case of Walmart a few years back where they had an aircon repairman come in and suddenly had a massive data leakage on their hand, but it's helping crack down on issues such as that. From our perspective, Aaron, we see this as a hugely enabling technology. As you said, customers have VPNs and there's definitely gonna be a stalwart base of um, users that will continue to need that functionality. But as customers start to look at I'm, the fact that they're moving to the cloud, the number of applications they are hosting internally is dropping. And when they take a double click into those, they typically find one or two applications that a lot of people need access to, while very few um, need, you know, have an unrestricted access requirement. This enables them to quickly turn on, you know, apply cl um, cloud based policy driven security to all of those internal assets and effectively kind of move them into, from a security perspective, to all the benefits you have when you move things to the cloud. Agreed. And in fact, it's one of those things that kind of, you know, tends to be a bit of a light bulb moment typically when we talk about this kind of thing. But why are we giving people access to applications that they don't need? 
it's redundant, both in terms of their day-to-day activity and for a security perspective, it's just causing a large amount of issues. Yeah, the whole concept of, uh, it, it goes back to that old adage of, you know, kind of all for one and one for all, three musketeer level security. That's yeah. what VPNs are designed for. And there are some users that may require that, but there's a lot of the rest of the organization that just need not access to one or two applications. And if that's delivered securely through ZPA, they've really reduced their threat surface. Definitely. And reduce the complexity as well, which is a pretty large part of why we're brought in also. I mean, you know, with multiple solutions in place, when you could just go through one, it seems a lot more straightforward. One of the other nice parts about this, which I will just touch on briefly before I move on to the next slide as well, is the application health monitoring. Um, <clears throat> off the back of this, our view into it is, well, we're here in every part of the transaction. We can see what your user's doing. Um, and again, I'll touch on this in just a second. We can see what your data center is doing and therefore what your applications are doing via our connector. So we can share that information for you. Um, one of the big things that we've been hearing internally, and in fact, it's affected how we've gone about our business, and it's definitely affected how we've changed our roadmap around, was troubleshooting. Um, you know, you can't just walk across the office floor anymore and ask, right, what are you doing? Let me see your screen. OK, let me click through this. Let me get that sorted. Um, so having someone that can actually openly display this information, say, OK, this is how this application is performing. The issue is actually on the user's end. We need them to quickly reset their laptop or vice versa. Everything's fine with the user and their Internet connectivity. However, the data center is up and running, but the application is actually stalling out and having a few problems. It just helps kind of eliminate that cut down time and get you back to doing what you should be doing on a more regular basis. And hopefully a lot wasted of time. Um, so I'm going to let Contact take over a little bit here and specifically Joe to talk a little bit around this space because this really is their specialty. Um, Zscaler have a large amount of technology partners and vendor partners, but at the end of the day, my specialty really is Zscaler. Um, this is where we partner up quite nicely with the guys over at Contact because this is their specialty, the more wider space. Whereas we're going to focus on one aspect, they're going to be the guys who can actually help get you fully up and running in the new world that we find ourselves in. So, Joe, over to you. Well, I'll make it quite brief. Uh, when we look at Zscaler as part of an ecosystem, there are a couple of key things that really make it a, a winning technology from our perspective. The ability to leverage the cloud to apply better um, artificial intelligence and analytics means that customers are learning and being more secure because of the uh, information that's coming together in a single place. The second part is the ability to automate around Zscaler. And so we've continued to integrate Zscaler into that wider ecosystem, into other security lifecycle approaches, such as uh, monitoring, threat detection, and response, and combine this into not only part of our monitoring service, but our uh, managed threat response service. So as items are being discovered in other parts of your network, we'll be able to see that, trigger it, and potentially use Zscaler to um, break the kill chain of an attack or to prevent exfiltration of data and to, to help remediate the, the challenges that come out. And so the ability to integrate Zscaler into that wider ecosystem really becomes key to developing a clearer picture of your overall security and helping better protect your organization from the attacks that target the gaps between different products and solutions. Um, one other thing just to touch on briefly on this slide, um, I've mentioned the name a few times on this call and if you ever speak to me in person, you will hear me mention them a hell of a lot more. Um, Microsoft are a very important technology, technology partner of ours. Um, we do a lot through them and with them. Um, you know, Azure AD, I've touched on a few times already. One of the nice advantages of going through Microsoft Azure AD and Zscaler is you get the benefit of skin provisioning to really push those you know, new updated policies out sooner rather than later. Um, and also in terms of 0365, you may have seen on an earlier side a simple configuration. Um, if time permits, I will actually show you what that looks like. But essentially, when we're breaking out to 0365 via Zscaler, firstly, as I've mentioned already, we have that two terabyte peering capacity um, into all the major service providers. But secondly, we've actually got a button whereby it's a simple click, literally inside the system, we call it the one click configuration. And that's it. We automatically bypass all your traffic and push it straight out to Microsoft if destined for a Microsoft 0365. So um, I'm going to take a minute now and actually go through what it would look like from a user experience on a more regular basis. Uh, my application is going to look a little bit different. Um, that's actually the manager's application, Christy. Um, and on the right side here, you've got a bit of a diagram as to what this would actually look like from 
a user experience perspective, which is a live trial going through an alternative solution and then through Zscaler. But I digress. So I'm just going to quickly stop sharing my screen and then reshare. So hopefully in a second, everyone will be able to see my entire screen rather than just the PowerPoint. One second, please. I'll, uh, I'll quickly wait for the <coughs> stream to catch up. Give it a few seconds. Okay, hopefully that's starting to appear on everyone's screens about now. Um, so what does this actually look like from a user experience perspective? Um, first thing in the morning, especially before coffee, I am not my best self. So having a long, complicated process to log in, get up and running on a daily basis is far less than ideal. Um, as my previous job role will tell you before Zscaler, I am not the best at technology first thing in the morning, but it's pretty simple here. So as you can see, I've got this little blue Zscaler icon. Well, hopefully you can see. I've got this little blue Zscaler icon just here at the top, which I'll click to open. And that's it. This is what we call the Zscaler Client Connector or ZApp. Um, so all this is doing is forwarding my traffic out via the fastest instance of Zscaler. At the minute, I believe I'm going through the London node, which tends to be the main one. I myself am based out of Oxford, um, but I do tend to travel around the country. So occasionally I'll route out via our Manchester DC instead. Likewise, if I'm ever traveling for company events, um, I could route out of a different DC or perhaps just if I'm you know, moving around or you know, ever routed out via a different DC for testing purposes or for demo purposes. Um, this side of it, the internet security side, what we call ZIA, I've actually not logged into since the day I joined Zscaler. Um, I signed in once, went through Okta, put in my input, um, went through single sign on, put in my little phone code and that was it. I've been signed in ever since. From a morning perspective and from a day-to-day -day user perspective, it's exactly the same. I don't have to log in because from Zscaler's point of view, why wouldn't you want your users active on the internet and protect on the internet? It really doesn't make any sense. From a private access perspective, I have to re-authenticate once a month. Um, typically, this tends to be around the 15th. Um, and luckily, I actually asked and mine has been able to be pushed over to uh, the afternoon, which was very much appreciated from the team. Um, so usually, I think it's about three o'clock. Um, like I say, I think it's the 15th or 16th. I can never quite remember. I just have to go through Opta once more, type in my password uh, and then type in the code for my phone just to make sure that I am still who I say I am and I've not lost my laptop or misplaced it and then been too embarrassed to sell the company. It's just making sure I should still be able to protect and access what I should can. So in terms of what that access would actually look like, I'm going to quickly go over to here and uh, hopefully everyone will be able to see my web browser. I don't know if uh, anyone from contact can just quickly confirm for me. Yeah, that looks good. Perfect. Yeah, all good. So just from a user perspective, um, again, while I'd like to think I'm pretty clued up on Zscaler at this point, um, my general knowledge around technology is perhaps spotty, to be polite to myself. Um, so I don't really know where a lot of this is hosted, as you can see. I'm just currently in my Opt portal. Um, but off the back of that, it doesn't really matter where my applications are hosted. And this is a large part of why I quite like using it as a user. So if I click through to Salesforce, for example, all you're going to see is me going through Zscaler and I'm there. I can access it. This is an externally hosted application for us. On the other hand, if I suddenly want to access something such as, uh, let's say, Apex, which I know we personally host internally, it's just going to go through, quickly check, should Aaron have access to Apex, and that's it, I'm there. This is internally hosted. This is just what my application is finding. So from our side, it really doesn't matter where anything's hosted. It doesn't matter if Salesforce is external or internal once you're in this complete package of Zscaler, which for me as a user is fantastic. I simply click and I'm there. Um, the, pretty much everything is just an application for me at this point. And likewise, if I want to go through and browse the open internet, I'm perfectly at liberty to do so. So if I want to go on, for example, LinkedIn, I'm there and I'm free to LinkedIn and I can go on out and do whatever I need to on my daily basis as well. So I'm just going to go back to the PowerPoint now. So <clears throat> there is typically four areas where we deliver value. Um, value is a pretty broad definition. Um, it's not just money. It's also the likes of productivity, um, complexity, simplicity, and also just general making your users happier. Because if your users aren't happy working there, then nine times out of 10, they're not going to be there for very long. So firstly is to make the business more agile and competitive. Um, accelerating this cloud adoption as I've banged on about a few times now in this webinar, has become 
very much vital in the past six to eight months and coming up to a year now. In all honesty, personally, I don't see this winding down anytime soon. Um, so let's go as a company. We haven't been in the office since March. Um, we're strongly recommended not to be back in the office and I don't see that changing. So as such, we've had to adopt a few extra cloud services than we normally would. And normally we are pretty cloud heavy. Um, and I think a lot more businesses will have to do the same as they go on. So really being able to make your business that bit more agile is a pretty key area from my point of view, especially at the minute. Secondly, would be protecting your digital footprint. Um, as I've touched on, there isn't really a corporate network anymore and it is expanding out at a very, very dramatic rate as people do start to now adopt cloud services at a you know, very rapid rate. Um, as such, you need something that's actually going to be there for you on a security perspective. As we touched on before, application transformation, network transformation, and then security transformation. Um, the policy-based access from anywhere is impressively needed especially when we're partnering with your AD, um, we can actually focus down on a single user basis. So for example, you may have a general rule across your entire business that, okay, we allow gambling, we don't really mind it. We don't really care if our users are on gambling websites, it doesn't impact us. But for that individual user, it may be a bit of a problem. Um, perhaps they're a little bit of an addict and just going on it a little bit too much and not getting the job done. You do have that in, you do then have the option to go down into that individual user's utility and just say, okay, this guy from the whole organization can no longer access this website. And likewise, from a security perspective, you may find that there are some people inside your organization who perhaps are subject to perhaps more risky information, financial teams, for example, um, and rather than them using Dropbox, which isn't something, maybe something you're not quite as happy for them to utilize, um, you can instead block them off, but otherwise have the general company open to using Dropbox. End user experience is again pretty crucial. Um, if your users aren't happy, then it's going to cause some serious issues in your business. Um, fast and direct access to the applications is always a strong corner point of our of our functionality and what we do. And finally, reducing cost and ensuring future cost avoidance. This kind of ties into the previous um, in terms of productivity as well. So there was a company which I went through and worked with a couple months ago now, actually with Contact. Um, where we figured out that with for a thousand users, um, they were each wasting about five minutes a day just on general backhauling complexity issues, you know, getting up, going for a cup of tea when things weren't working quite as smoothly as they should be. Um, and that's 5,000 minutes a day. Uh, we ended up going through it. We worked on what their average cost per employee was per hour, specifically after transferring those minutes into an hour. Um, and it ended up that we were spending hundreds of thousands and losing potentially hundreds of thousands just on that latency. So we went through and kind of discussed how could we better help them and you know facilitate around that. And uh, this is quite a nice quote from uh, Chris Rumgall from GE, which I quite like because it was one of the first ones I heard in the company um, and it's one that's really stuck with me. But it is a rare occasion in history where it got more secure, better and cheaper all at once, which is what we're trying to do. We're trying to make life easier both for your users, for everyone inside the business, and specifically for yourselves who are on this call. Um, you know, if we're not making IT teams lives easier at the end of the day, then you know, it's all very well and good improving security, but everyone needs to be happy with the solution. And finally, just to uh, kind of finish off my side and I'll hand back to contact here. Um, typically, what are the next steps? What I've given you today is a bit of a modified version of typically some of the things that I talk about. Um, just in case someone's actually spoken to me before, normally I do a bit of a question session beforehand um, with someone like the likes of contact and we go through and we really delve into what are you looking to achieve in the next six months, eight months, a year. You know, we delve into that information, um, we work off a presentation of that and then we kind of go through similar slides to what we've done today. Then we move on to something similar to an architecture workshop, you know, breaking down, okay, that's where you're looking to get to. Um, how do we actually get you there? You know, what's then the progression off the back of that? What do we need to do? Do we then need to, for example, are you looking to immediately move over to O365? Okay, so that's what we need to focus on for the short term. For the long term, perhaps, we're actually going to move our applications over to the likes of Azure and AWS. Okay, well then how do we help facilitate that? You know, what are your current utility? What are you using now? Um, what's crucial to your business and how do we make sure that that's working properly? We do a full breakdown on that one. The next step will be a proof of value. Um, we're that confident in what we do as Zscaler, we don't give you a demo environment. What we actually provide is a live 30 day free trial. <clears throat> There's quite a few reasons for that. And to be honest, depending on who you talk to in Zscaler will depend on the answer that you get. 
from my perspective and the reason that I tend to provide 30 day proof of free trials and you know we do these POVs, these proof of values, um, it's because a lot of the people that we tend to do these with purchase Zscaler, they like the solution. That's my job here. I'm, to, I'm here to make sure that what you're buying is correct for you and that we are actually a good fit for your services. Because if we're not, I'm going to tell you because otherwise I'm going to be the one who's here you're chewing up every day for the next X amount of months of the contract that you decide to sign up with. Um, and one of the nice advantages of us doing this and making it a full 30 day trial whereby you can go through and try everything that you would in a live instance is that if you do decide to purchase and go through, you have something that's actually ready for you. Um, my SE, who unfortunately wasn't available for this session today, is a man by the name of Martin Sufjan. Um, he and I will actually set up and make sure that everything is set ready for production. And likewise, this is why we integrate quite nicely with partners like Contact and Contact are the main one in particular, because we want to make sure that we are getting this ready for your rest of us, your estate. So while we're sat there on this 30 day trial, making sure that, OK, everything Zscaler is ready for Zscaler, Contact will be sat there making sure, OK, this is how your other services are actually going to benefit and nicely integrate and we can trial and see that as well, which you wouldn't be able to do in a demo environment. I think. Just to end this off now from my side and finish off with a final thought, which uh, our CEO quite likes to bandy about internally and is pretty common as a saying for us lot. In, but would Netflix build its cloud service with thousands of DVD players? Um, we've been built for this world that we find ourselves in. As I say, we've now been built in business for I think it's 11 years in March, if I remember correctly. Um, We've been up and running for a while now and even before that our CEO Jay has been working in this industry for a long time. We've been built for this world so we are pretty well equipped to be helping you deal with it and you know, function in it as best as possible now that we are forced ourselves into this world perhaps in some instances a little bit more rapidly than we would traditionally have liked. Um, as you can see here from a data center and hardware perspective you've got Azure, you've got AWS, from your applications in the data center, Workday and Salesforce are hugely critical. And from a network security perspective, that's where we step in quite strongly. So that's pretty much the end of my side. Uh, I'll hand back to yourself, Joe. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, we just did, did have one question coming in through the Q&A. Uh, and if you do have other questions, feel free to put them in there. There is a bit of a delay, and so some questions may, may respond to offline. Uh, but uh, regarding um, users connecting to on-premise file shares and shared network drives using Zscaler, and I would assume in this case, obviously, using ZIA as well. Mm -hmm. How does that work? Of course, quite nice and easy. Um, so this would fall into our Zscaler private access side. Um, so what we're going to do there is the connector. So you actually, let's quickly cut back just so we've actually got the architecture up while I'm discussing. Uh, here, perfect. Um, so as you can see here, uh, the way that we work on this side is we are just putting a connector in front of your data center wherever your applications are hosted. So it doesn't matter if it's a cloud based data center or an on premise. So in the example I gave earlier, for example, for chance um, when I was discussing, OK, you know, I've got an application that I'm now ready to move over from my data center to a cloud. All we're doing is moving the connector across. It's exactly the same. So if you have a large host of information and data that's going to be stored inside an internal data center, all we're going to be doing is we put that connector in front of it. Your users are then connecting through to that one instead of the one based in the cloud, and they're still accessing, or perhaps if they shouldn't be not accessing, um, whatever information they would like on that daily basis. And from a user's perspective, the benefit is that they're whether they're sitting at home, sitting in the office, sitting in a Costa Coffa, they simply go and access that share drive, mm -hmm. and the ZPA, the Z app client works in conjunction with ZPA to just to simply enable access to that resource for them wherever they are. Yeah, I mean, I, as you saw earlier in my demonstration, you know, um, when I loaded up, so let's cut back. I think this is still displaying my whole screen, but when I cut back to Apex, Apex is actually one of our internally hosted applications. Um, it's not something that's out in, in one of the cloud data centers just because there is a lot of sensitive information in there. As you can see, it's specifically for employees. Um, but to load up something which I know is usually fairly less sensitive because it's pretty common and we don't really hide anything away. Um, for 0365, for example, as you can see, it's got some particular in interesting bits inside of here. Um, so, for example, Skype for Business line slash link 0365. Um, I think if I actually type in o Office 365 instead, we may get a few more articles. 
as always, it's dependent on what you're spelling. There we go, perfect. But as you can see, we've got a whole host of information here, some of which we don't really want exposed to an external infrastructure, because as I say, there may always be, I mean, a lot of the businesses I deal with are financial and legals. Um, those guys will always have little bits of information that they don't want exposed to an external source, which I completely get and understand. One of my bigger customers in the UK, um, they actually provide um, financial software for these firms and banks in a lot of instances. And from a development perspective, they do not want anyone accessing that information. Um, they're just not comfortable because that is pretty much the lifeblood of their company. So they host it internally. They're still connecting through to it because they get the private access. Doesn't really make a difference. They've got a whole host of infrastructure and other tools which are based up in AWS for them. That's their preference over Azure. Um, but it doesn't really make a difference. You're still just going to connect through to it the same way. Brilliant stuff. Well, thanks for that answer, Aaron. We did have one other question that came in about um, how Zscaler, you know, how does it actually work? What are what are the components? And uh, I think Phil did answer that online, but the Zscaler is a service. You don't have any infrastructure internally. You simply reroute your traffic for ZIA. For ZPA to work, you're going to have a connector that will be deployed in your infrastructure. And so it'll be simply a, an application running on a, on a machine that will provide the connector for your applications into the ZPA cloud, uh, but primarily sells as a service. Definitely. So um, I'll quickly see if I can get it open back up actually. But if I cut back to the application here, <clears throat> this is all that sits on my device. Um, if you're in an office based location, you would also have the option of a GRE, IPSEC tunnel or PAC file. Um, from a remote, remote worker basis, you're going to have either the Zscaler client connector, which to be honest, I would recommend because you have the option of tunnel 2.0, which I'm not currently on, but can scan all ports and protocols, which can obviously be quite important information for an organization. Um, but also the private access runs for the same thing. And if you're looking at ZPA, you're going to have to have it anyway. So it's quite nice to tie it all up into one. Um, alternatively, as I say, you could utilize a PAC file and deploy it. This application is currently on my instance running off a MacBook Pro. Um, also Android, tablets, phones. Um, I don't have it on my iPhone just because I personally quite like the separation between work and private, but many of my colleagues do have it on their iPhones. Um, many of them have it on their Androids, iPads. We don't really care what device you're accessing it from. Um, and as I said up top, you've got up to 17 concurrent devices with that as well. Um, the worst offender I've known on that one has been one of our architects who had 12, um, which still obviously five extra devices allowance. It, overall, 17 tends to be more than enough for most people. Excellent stuff, Aaron. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the last questions we had was about end user experience and how much can you measure, monitor, or troubleshoot user experiences. And that question is actually in two parts. The first of which would be, when users are you accessing ZPA, because in those instances, you have a lot more data. Now, beyond that, of course, through the console, you'll be able to measure and monitor users, you know, consumption of Twitter and social media, other websites, you know, and that's broken down by, tra by traffic category and uh, overall time and usage. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, I mean, looks like we've still got a bit of time. So one of the things I'll actually do is quickly show you what that would look like. So <clears throat> apologies, this is actually a demo environment, so it's not going to be the most realistic. Um, and as my colleagues and I have the chance to mess around with this quite often and change it around, uh, a few bits may be in different locations. So please bear with me for a few seconds. So from a ZPA perspective, uh, should actually be in the, there we go. Perfect example of me forgetting where I've left things. So from a user perspective and seeing what that is. So here in this instance, um, unfortunately, I don't think we've actually got any usage data on this today because um, we've not been trialing it too much. Uh, I think it's just been myself who's had a demo today a little bit earlier on, but to show you what it would actually look like. As you can see here, you can see that there's actually an issue here with the two domain controllers. And if we click through, you can see that as such, the connectors here are actually down and having faults because of that. And therefore, in this RDP session, it's failing through. On, on the other hand, the Guacamole AD bridge, as you can also see, the connectors are up and running, therefore we can access the servers and therefore we can access the application. Whereas here, because we've turned them off for the sake of the demo, the, uh, the connectors themselves are actually down. And from a ZIA perspective and user experience perspective, we have kind of a two part answer to this one. Um, the first part I'll take you through now. The second part we actually don't, I actually don't have access to on a demo portal, um, but it's called ZIA, the digital experience. It's fairly similar to what I've just shown you here. 
in these APA side, but it's more based off an internet perspective, whereby ultimately the theory behind it is, well, we still have insight into all that traffic. You know, we're still the ones connecting users through to their services, such as O365 and Salesforce. So we're giving you that information as well and saying, okay, this is the latency. We can see it's coming from Salesforce. This is why your user's having an issue. Or likewise, okay, this is where we're seeing the issue. You know, your user's internet connection is actually a little bit slower than it would be normally. So maybe they need to reach out and contact their internet service provider. In terms of what day-to-day -day logs would look like, this may just take a second to load. But I'll probably quickly refresh it. Perfect. So this is a, again, bit of a demo portal. Normally, Carla tends to have quite interesting transactions. So let's go in here just so you can see what it'll look like. Um, as I said earlier, a little bit before, um, I work quite commonly with legal and financial. It's one of my main kind of groups that I work with actually, um, just because it's a very difficult time for those guys at the minute. But I'm pretty confident because it's been proven before, any information that you should need is buried in here somewhere. Um, in fact, I'll quickly scroll through here just so you can see. But we've got, as you can see, currently displayed event user time, whether it was allowed or blocked, We've also got if there was any threats based in there, and I'll show you what that threat would actually look like, what department the user's based in. As I say, we sync up with your AD, so we do have insight into all of that information as well as where your user's actually based. Then you have the latency on our side, which we're fully open and honest about. If there was any DLP kicking in there, any IPs, SSLs inspected, file name, if that was part of it, so on and so forth. As I say, any information you should require will be in here somewhere. And we'll hold all of this up to six months. If you require it for any longer, that's where I highly recommend you speak to contact um, because we can stream it over to a CMOS SOC. So going through a little bit, just so you can see, this is click to copy. So if I want to see exactly what it was they were doing going on, I can just simply highlight it, paste it in, categorization, classification, and application, and show you quickly what a threat would look like. Let's go on to the Botnet Call Max. So I can then go through and see, okay, so this was actually win32 banker.zeus and if we click on it this will actually take you to our shared threat library which is where we keep a hash logs of all the threats that we encounter quickly just go onto all just so it's highlighting everything okay looks like it's not working currently for this one so i'll just quickly cut back and onto the cross-site scripting instead so it'll basically just give you a little bit of a breakdown of what that threat would actually look like if we go through and click on it here as well there we go, perfect. So it'll tell you the threat score, i.e. what we deem, um, the severity, signature ID, and a short description of what exactly it is. So I hope that answers your question. Great stuff, Aaron. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Hopefully this was an, a really informative session. If there are any follow-up questions, of course, we'll uh, take those offline. And uh, thank you very much for joining, Phil. Yeah, so just, just to reiterate, thank you very much to Joe and Aaron for a fantastic job there. And there are a few other questions on here which um, I've, I've noted down and we will get back with it to everybody with a, with all the questions being asked today uh, with, with um, you know, a Q&A session back. So once again, thanks everybody for joining and uh, have, have a good rest of the day.